of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Wednesday, September 13th, 2023. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Uhuru Williams, historian and founding director of the Racial Justice Initiative at the University of St. Thomas, and Michael Lansing, professor of history at Augsburg University, on their public history project, Over Police and Unprotected, in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Then, Mario Oriza, investigative reporter at Floodlight News, on the first initiative in the country to turn a private energy distribution company public for, uh, statewide in Maine. Meanwhile, Kevin McCarthy begins impeachment in the House in a desperate attempt to save his job. Republicans apparently are sitting on testimony from an FBI agent who oversaw the Hunter Biden investigation that refutes their so-called whistleblower. UAW rolls out work stoppage plans as the deadline for its strike loom. Gas prices and rent drive inflation higher in August. And the poverty rate soared amongst children and more in 2022. Wisconsin Republicans cave on impeaching a liberal judge for her winning a campaign, but offer a fake independent redistricting plan in its stead. Meanwhile, the CDC, following the FDA approval, recommends that now FDA approved boosters to everyone. Five former Memphis cops indicted in the Tyree Nichols case and the Libyan flood death toll now at over 5,000. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, we are, again, uh, short-staffed because uh, we, we, as a show, decided to uh, get covid and, um, and so it, I don't know why we decided to do that. It was in retrospect, a bad decision, but, um, sometimes you try, it's like a, I had, I was faced with an option. Am I going to spend $4,500 a person on sending us each to a trust camp where we do rope climbing and uh, trust falls? Or we all get COVID and isolate from each other. And of course, that's the one I chose. Um, it's conceivable that Emma will be here tomorrow uh, and I'll be out, take a little bit of a, a rest, but we'll see. Uh, but thanks for joining us. Uh, appreciate your support. Appreciate all the, uh, the nice messages we have gotten. Um, so the... Uh, Republican Party uh, yesterday essentially made the decision to hand uh, Joe Biden a uh, a nice gift in the form of attempting to impeach him. There was a lot of debate when Democrats were impeaching um, Donald Trump, which they did twice, if you'll recall, as to whether this was going to hurt Democratic chances in the 2020 election. I had this debate with people both on the, uh, you know, within the sort of center to the, all the way to the left. And I think that even came up with uh, Tim Pool in, um, 
in the uh, last debate that uh, he had with me where he called me Thanos. And I always contended that it wasn't in any way going to inhibit uh, democratic elections. In fact, it was probably going to help because the democratic base needed uh, to see that Democrats were actually fighting Donald Trump and understood that he was a problem. I don't think it works the same way. Democrats and Republicans are simply not the same uh, um, type of voters for the most part. Because I don't think this ever is a strategy that affects people in the middle for the most part. I don't think there's huge swaths of those people. I definitely think the Republican base would have been upset had the Republicans not impeached uh, or attempted to impeach Joe Biden. But they were going to vote anyways. It, it, you know, as opposed to um, uh, Democrats in, let's say, 2018 or 2020. Um, and so uh, what I do think this is going to do is it's going to um, uh, cause Democrats to rally around Joe Biden, even though uh, I think uh, the majority of Democrats feel like he is too uh, old to run again. Um, it's just going to highlight, I think, some of the craziness on the Republican side because they really have not much to offer in terms of these impeachment hearings. Here is um, Kevin McCarthy on, uh, on Capitol Hill speaking to the press, um, talking about his impeachment inquiry. And let's be clear. You can, he cannot start this road and get off the impeachment uh, uh, trail. He has to. They have to impeach Biden at this point. Here he is. You know, in the months that we were gone, in the weeks, House Republicans have uncovered serious and credible allegations into President Biden's conduct. Taken together, these allegations paint a picture of a culture of corruption. Now here's what we know so far. Through our investigations, we have found that President Biden did lie to the American people about his own knowledge of his family's foreign business dealings. Eyewitnesses have testified that the president joined on multiple phone calls and had multiple interactions. Dinners resulted in cars and millions of dollars into his son's and his son's business partners. We know that bank records show that nearly Just to make that clear, what, what um, the testimony regarding those phone calls was uh, specifically that in the middle of meetings that uh, Hunter Biden would have, he would call up uh, the president, put him on speakerphone. The president wasn't even necessarily aware there were other people in the room, talk about the weather or just check in. Hey, dad, just checking in. How you doing? as a way of showing uh, everybody in the room that he had a relationship with his father <laughs> because it was very conceivable that his father would have shut him off at that point. Um, with no doubt, Hunter Biden, I don't want to say every single dollar he's made, has been made via nepotism. That, however, maybe nepotism is not the right word. He's traded on his name. He's traded on his relationship with his father. But that does not implicate Joe Biden in that manner. And believe me, there was there there would be a lot of people who could be uh, impeached if that was the case. Continue. $3 million in payments were directed to the Biden family members and associates through various shale companies. The Treasury Department alone has more than 150 transactions involving the Biden family and other business associates that were flagged as suspicious activity by U.S. banks. Even a trusted FBI informant has alleged a bribe to the Biden family. Biden used his official office to coordinate with Hunter Biden's business partners about Hunter's role in Burisma, a Ukrainian energy company. Finally, despite these serious allegations, it appears that the president's family has been offered special treatment by Biden's own administration. 
treatment that not otherwise would have received if they were not related to the president. These are allegations of abuse of power, obstruction, and corruption. And they warrant further investigation by the House of Representatives. That's why today I am directing our House committee to open a formal impeachment inquiry into President Joe Biden. This logical right, next let's, uh, step. Let's go to, I mean, since uh, uh, he's talking about uh, what warrants investigation, these investigations have been ongoing for two and a half years. And let's check in on what actual charges they have, or not even charges, evidence they have on these allegations. Remember, anybody can make allegations. But here is Representative Scott Perry, Republican from Pennsylvania, uh, with uh, a reporter, we don't know uh, that reporter's name, at the Freedom Caucus uh, press conference outside of, uh, uh, off of, just off of Capitol Hill, right after um, this announcement about the impeachment. He would do that, and I don't think it'd be appropriate. All right, last question. Yes, ma'am. Can I ask what actual evidence do you have as opposed to allegations to show to the American public that would merit an actual impeachment inquiry of Joe Biden and prove that today isn't just about some of you? Oh, I don't know. McCarthy for the sake of enacting political revenge. Uh, this this isn't about political Trump. revenge. We have the bank accounts. We can see, ma'am, you can see that the homes that the Bidens own can't be afforded on a, on a congressional or Senate salary. You also understand that it's Pause not it for normal. A second. The, the homes that the Bidens own, he's talking about the relatives of the Bidens. Right. <laughs> who were not in Congress. Go ahead. Continue, go back. Ma'am, you can see that the homes that the Bidens own can't be afforded on a, on a congressional or Senate salary. You also understand that it's not normal for family members to receive millions of dollars from overseas interests. Those things aren't normal. That's not normal to have 20 cell, shell country, companies. These things are not normal, and it alludes to not only just widespread corruption, but money laundering, if not influence peddling itself. And we also have the president, on, the vice president at the time, on record saying that the prosecutor was fired. Well, son of a bitch. The prosecutor was fired, right? Because the prosecutor was going after the, the company that his son was working on. That's what we have. If you can't see that, if you are, if you are that blunt, look, I'll turn it over to the attorneys. People can't see that. They think it's political revenge. It's because you don't report on it. No, no, you're not, we hear I don't think, reporting on it today. But I'm not sure how you know what the American people think, but here's what they might wonder. Actually, if you're a federal prosecutor, you would be... Um, so here's someone trying to report on it. And the Burisma thing, everyone, I think, at this point knows that uh, the reason why this uh, prosecutor Shokin in uh, Ukraine was removed was because they were not going after Burisma enough. And, uh, I mean, there were other reasons. This was stated American policy. Um, and I guess the argument is that the stated American policy which existed prior to uh, Hunter Biden being uh, put on that board of directors uh, was because Hunter Biden was on the board of directors. Unclear. Um, here is, uh, let's just do, this is the way that you should react to impeachment. Let's do number four. Um, and um, good for John Fetterman. Here is how he reacted to the news that the Republicans were going to impeach Joe Biden. I was asking about this news that uh, Speaker McCarthy has formally launched an impeachment in her, has he said he's going to- Oh my God, really? Oh my gosh, you know, oh, it's devastating. <laughs> Ooh, don't do it, please don't do it. Oh no, oh no. We gotta run back to the office, but- There you go. I think uh, John Fetterman knows this is a big winner for uh, Democrats. Uh, it should be interesting to see um, on what charges they're going to impeach Joe Biden. Um, we're going to take a break in a moment. And when we do, we'll get back with uh, Uhura 
uh, Yohura Williams and Michael Lansing. They are of the um, Public History Project, Overpoliced and Unprotected, Minneapolis, St. Paul. We'll get to that in just a moment. Um, first, a couple of words from our sponsors. First off, uh, every day on this program, I have at least a bottle of this. This is not just water. This is water uh, with liquid IV. What is liquid IV? It is the number one powdered hydration brand in America. I don't know. I've been doing this for now three, maybe four years. I can't even remember. Literally five or six times a week. I will have at least a bottle of this. I will tell you right now, I'm going to have two bottles of it today. Um, it is the only thing that is powering me through the show right now in terms of um, having COVID, staying hydrated. So important just in general, but uh, particularly when you're ill. But if I was uh, somebody who worked out uh, in the morning, you want to stay hydrated. If it's something that you feel run down in the afternoon, you want to get uh, rehydrated. If you're doing something like hiking or uh, you're traveling a lot, there's really, I mean, there's never a time where it's not good to, uh, to be hydrated. Liquid IV comes in 12 delicious, refreshing flavors to keep your hydration routine exciting. Um, one stick of Liquid IV. They come in like uh, little packets, maybe the size of a normal person's finger. And in 16 ounces of water, hydrates you two times faster and more efficiently than water alone. Contains five essential vitamins, B3, B5, B6, B12, and vitamin C. It has three times the amount of electrolytes as uh, leading sports drinks. It is made with quality ingredients, non-GMO, free from gluten, free from dairy and soy. Um, they have now, I think it's three flavors that are uh, sugar-free. Liquid IV believes that the equi that equitable, a equitable access to clean and abundant water is the foundation of a healthier world. So they partner with leading organizations to fund and foster innovative solutions that help communities protect both their water and their futures. To date, also, Liquid IV has donated something like over 39 million servings in 50 plus countries around the world. Real people, real flavor, real hydrating. Grab your Liquid IV in bulk nationwide at Costco or go to liquidiv.com. Use the code majority rep at checkout, get 20% off. That's 20% off anything when you shop better hydration today using promo code majority rep at liquidiv.com. Also, um, one of our sponsors today is my, um, one of my favorite ones. Right now, sunsetlakesebeday.com at sunsetlakesebeday.com all of their topical CBD products are going to be on sale right now you can save 25% off on topicals and qualifying bundles when you use the code smooth at checkout so what's available the arnica and uh, um, uh, CBD rub sebeday rub um, that use for muscles and uh, I happen to use it for my uh, eczema, um, also like uh, uh, skin lotion. It's the only skin lotion and the unscented one that I will put on my body. And really, to be honest with you, I only put it on my legs, uh, really only on my calves. For some reason, my calves dry out. I, I know that's weird, but, um, but you can put it on your hands. You can put it anywhere uh, these handcrafted Sebede uh, topicals are great for every part of your body. Um, like I say, their salve with arnica, their lotion, the muscle rub with idacane for folks who need a little bit more relief, all really, really effective. Not only have they uh, permanently reduced their prices on their most popular top topicals, but today through the end of day tomorrow, that's uh, Thursday, September 14th at 11.59 p.m., you can save an extra 25% uh, with the code SMOOTH. For everything else, use the code LEFT IS BEST. And uh, not only will you get a discount, you will snag a sweet Majority Report theme sticker. So check that out, sunsetlakesebade.com. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Yuhuru Williams and Michael Lansing, right after this.
We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. It is a pleasure to welcome to the program Uhuru Williams. He's a historian and founding director of the Racial Justice Initiative at the University of St. Thomas. Michael Lansing, professor of history at Augsburg University. Uh, they both um, have uh, created a, the public history project, Overpoliced and Unprotected, in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Um, gentlemen, uh, welcome to the program. Thanks for having us. Thanks so much. Um, let's start um, with uh, Uhuru. The, the, uh, the, the first uh, documentary, anyways, that you guys have done over at the uh, Public ha uh, um, History Project, and, and I want to, we'll, we'll come around to uh, this. Actually, let's, uh, let's start this with, uh, with Michael. You, let's talk about that first uh, 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 documentary. Um, it, it starts in 1975. Uh, there's been a real problem policing in, in, in Minneapolis, St. Paul since at least then. Oh yeah, absolutely. And at Over Police and Under Protected, what Professor Williams and I are doing is trying to unearth, to recover, collect, and share these stories of unjust policing, as well as resistance to unjust policing that go back into the 1970s, 1960s, 1950s. We can keep going back and back and back all the way to the establishment of the police department in Minneapolis in the 1870s. Um, and so, uh, Professor Williams, um, to, how does this set the table for what has been going on? Because I think, you know, most people obviously have, have become more aware of the issues uh, with the Minneapolis PD. Um, the DOJ just, uh, I guess, in June uh, came out with a report that was pretty damning. Um, talk about the connection of this historical, uh, ex you know, existence of problems in this and, and why this is important to understand where we are today. I think it's absolutely critical for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, uh, people just have a deep historical amnesia about the history of police reform in this community. It's not just Minnesota, it's nationally, but in Minneapolis in particular, that um, amnesia has been deadly in terms of how we think about reforming the police. And part of our project is to document those moments when there's conversation um, and concern over policing that ultimately ends up replicating some of the things that we're even seeing in our contemporary moment. You know, we have an opportunity for a consent decree, and yet the other day, here's the union reasserting um, itself in that conversation. We have all the hopes and aspirations for reform placed on one or two individuals within the department. We saw that in the 1980s with Tony Boza. We're seeing it again in our contemporary moment um, with uh, what's happening now with the new chief of police um, and a commissioner of public safety within the city of Minneapolis. So part of our project, as Michael um, shared, was to recover these stories not solely as a cautionary tale, but hopefully to deepen and engage people in a larger conversation about what public safety looks like and to move away from this model of policing, which ultimately has been quite problematic and quite deadly, uh, particularly for communities of color um, and marginalized people in the Twin Cities. Um, uh, Professor Lansing, what, what is it about history? Is it, is it unique to this country? I mean, it, 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 the um, I, I once interviewed uh, uh, Gore Vidal about uh, United States of Amnesia, <laughs> and at the time, you know, this was twenty years ago, and uh, it was in the context of the Iraq War. Then at the time, I really didn't fully understand what he was talking about, uh, to be honest. And uh, twenty years later, I'm an older guy. I realize, like, oh my God, uh, people think George Bush was great, but I'm seeing it also in the context of like things like Reconstruction. How much of this is like, I mean, we, we, just talk, I get there's a little bit ethereal maybe, but this process of how easily we forget the history. I mean, one would assume that people in Minneapolis know what's happened over the course of decades with their police department, but it seems like it's a revelation. Yeah, absolutely. This is a very common problem, a very common issue. In many ways, it defines how so many people in the United States experience the past. They experience it either through amnesia, which is an, you know, the act of forgetting, or through memory making, um, which is the act of remembering certain things and forgetting others. Uh, like we can think about how much our politics today are driven by nostalgia, for instance. Um, you can argue that the whole idea of make America great again is, is nothing but nostalgia. Um, and nostalgia and memory are not history. Um, super important to understand that. 
Um, but this dynamic of forgetting or choosing to forget or misremembering or only remembering certain things while forgetting others is as old as the country itself. It's absolutely crucial to understand that there's so much that is related to the past when we think about what our present is and what we want our future to be. The stakes are really high. And that's why you see, I would argue, so much um, nostalgia, so much amnesia, um, because partly it's human nature to be sure, but when it's expressed collectively, whether we're talking about the mistreatment of people by police officers or a whole host of other issues facing the country and communities all across it, there's no question that we have to think about how Americans are thinking or not thinking about the past. Um, uh, Professor Williams, d is there um, uh, an are there things that you can point to in terms of an attempt an attempt by um, let's say advocates of uh, the police, the police union, for instance, to obscure this? I mean, on some level, like right, like this this is not a historical story. It is an ongoing story. It is just one that, like, I don't know, is was it historical that there was a problem three years ago? Was there was it historical that there was a problem five years ago, ten years ago, uh, or two months ago? Like, at what point do you draw that line? This is a continuum. It seems like. I think that's the the line that we walk on our project. As as historians, of course, we respect the fact that you know we're looking at the past, but we're hoping that it will illuminate in our contemporary moment ways that people could be thinking um, about addressing issues of police uh, brutality um, and public safety reform in uh, Minneapolis and the Twin Cities as a whole. Uh, part of the question that you asked, um, uh, Professor Lansing, I think animates our work in this sense. You know, uh, William Dean Howells famously told Edith Wharton when she was embarking on her literary career that what the American public always wants is a tragedy with a happy ending. And so we're very quick to want to write that happy ending. We saw it in Minneapolis in the aftermath of the conviction of, of uh, Derek Chauvin for the murder of George Floyd, where you had um, the mayor come out and declare you know, George Floyd came to uh, Minneapolis to better his life, but our community is better as a result. And it's kind of like all is done. And a week later, they're taking down George Floyd Square. And then six, seven months later, we have the uh, the killing of, well, not even that long. We had the, the killing of Dante Wright. And then later on, Amir Locke um, was killed by uh, Minneapolis police. So part of the problem is that desire to get to the after note without dealing with and kind of uh, tackling the deeper issues of why these problems persist with regard to policing in, in the Twin Cities is, is the bigger issue. We saw this in the aftermath of Rodney King. It was asked to the chief of police at that time, John Locks, do you think it could ever happen here? And he said, you know, of course not. You know, we, we have could happen anywhere, but he said we have good training. As long as we have good training, um, we can avoid that. Well, we're now the epicenter in that conversation. Other communities have found themselves in this space in the past what we do in the next few years and, and how important history is in, tour, in, in terms of setting the foundations for that, um, as, as Michael shared, will be critical. Because if you don't know that history, you've got people essentially believing they're reinvent, reinventing the wheel or doing something that's novel when in fact they are replicating the harm that we've seen in the past. And we could talk, you know, countless examples of that um, in terms of the introduction of technology as a, you know, this is going to be what um, evens the playing field and creates um, equity in terms of policing. And all those have failed in the past, primarily for the reasons that we we talk about in the project. Yeah, I mean, it, it just on that theme, right? I mean, I I, uh, I I worked at a radio station that had four different or five different ownerships over the course of five years, and I watched that same dynamic. They come in with the exact same sort of like, we're going to do this. And I'm like, well, actually, they tried that six months ago and it didn't work, but because they were new leadership. But how does that happen in the context of a, a, a city where like these reforms theoretically are observed publicly? If you're going to end up being in a position to institute these reforms, like is there a lack of, is it just simply ignorance or is it a lack of sincerity on, uh, in terms of those who have the ability to impose reforms? Uh, or is it the pushback they get from those reforms um, is so strong and sort of, um, uh, I guess, uh, buried that they can't call on resources, you know, uh, constituencies to support them in those reform movements? 
I think all those things are at play, depending on the particular time and the particular moment. And as historians, what Professor Williams and I want to do, as soon as someone says, you know, police reform, we want to talk about the history of reform. So we, we can talk about, here in Minneapolis, we can talk about the 19-teens, when for one mayoral term, between 1917 and 1918, you had socialists in the mayor's office in City Hall in Minneapolis. You had a socialist chief of police who encouraged police officers to unionize. That's actually the origins or birth of our local police union, right? And that was part of an effort to tamp down on graft and vice. It's like, let's pay these officers more. Let's give them better working conditions. Coming out of the labor movement, that is reform. That's part of the history of reform here. And of course, that would shock, that history in fact does shock many local residents who have seen the police union in the last 30 to 40 years be so profoundly active in politics at the local and state level, shaping public policy around public safety. That's just one example. And if we think about police reform, and this is what historians are saying all over the country, that this long history of police reform shows that very little actually changes in terms of the experiences of communities of color with the police, number one. And number two, it costs municipalities millions and millions of dollars. It actually efforts to professionalize, efforts to reform, cost more money, and very little changes in terms of the experience of so many residents and citizens on the ground. Professor Williams, I mean, have we... Sam, Go ahead. just to just, uh, um, Michael's last point, which is, is critical. He loves to uh, frame this for audiences that we engage in the public around two questions that are absolutely essential to this discourse. Um, who is the public and what counts as safety? And if we think about that in, through a historical lens, it actually illuminates a lot about when these moments go bad. Because are we talking about police or, or are we talking about reforms that would be meaningful to those uh, people like in um, Minneapolis in the 1980s, the LBGTQ plus community, um, which what found itself um, on the receiving end of a great deal of police brutality in that moment, um, which was you know part and parcel of what we're trying to kind of disclose here or get people to understand. Certainly African-Americans and indigenous people um, have, you know, there's a long history of police brutality with regard to, to uh, those communities and, and here in the Twin Cities. The birth of the American Indian movement, AIM, um, which is modeled on the Black Panther Party for self-defense, happens in Minneapolis because of the treatment of indigenous people by police in Minneapolis. So that, that history is absolutely essential. But those questions that Michael frames, I think for us are very important. And I think they're questions that communities have to ask themselves. Uh, when they put up a new precinct in 1985, the people that came out and they talked ex extensively about the business community and whom it would serve and how it would, they didn't talk about how African-Americans and indigenous people um, experienced policing in that community. And ultimately, those are the people who found themselves on the receiving end of that police brutality, on that um, you know, invisibility, which is deadly. I mean, again, the only time people seem to notice is when you have the loss of life, you have an Amir Locke or you have a George Floyd or you have a, um, you know, Dante Wright. But the reality is that even in those moments, if you're asking those questions, who is the public and what counts as safety, if you're not thinking about those groups as being part of the public, it really doesn't matter. You don't get the change you need in order to, to make real lasting reform. That's, that's I mean, a, I feel like a um, that dynamic is a problem that we have when we assess, is the economy good? Because we will measure it based upon a certain subset of the American population. Uh, is our health care good? We measure it by the fact that maybe princes uh, from Saudi Arabia will come here to get uh, health care, but it's not available to um, a, a wide range of people. So the, the point being that if you force people to reckon with the question, who is the community, they have to be aware that maybe they're not uh, including large segments of what we would normally assume our community and uh, safety being for those people, meaning something different than maybe, um, uh, well, I'm trying to protect money in my bank as opposed to like being able to have my kid go to the supermarket and not worry that they're going to get stopped by the cops uh, for, for being black. Um, what well, just, and we only have a couple minutes here, but is it, uh, it, it is it a wholesale failure of like the concept of reform that we're dealing with here? Or is it just that there is a superstructure that is specific to this institution that is, um, and maybe this is the same question from just a, a different end, that is so uh, resilient? 
Uh, Professor Lansing, why don't you take that? Well, two things come to mind right away when you raise these issues and, and make those statements. One is that, you know, policing in the United States is born in the 19th century from a variety of sources, and it is set up to preserve law and order in a profoundly inequitable and unequal place, the United States in the 19th century, right? We can think of all the people who are excluded in that space, and law and order is about keeping things the same. And so policing as an institution is built to do certain kinds of work, and you can try to change it. And of course, there have been innumerable efforts to change and transform and reform policing. But um, if you go back to the 19th century origins of policing, you get what you get, right? Um, that's the first thing that comes to mind. The second thing that comes to mind, though, is, you know, at over-policed and underprotected in MSP, one of the things that Professor Williams and I do is we are always trying to talk about public safety because too often public safety and policing are conflated. And in so many communities around this nation, including ours, public safety has been defined as policing, which, of course, is part of the problem. It's a significant piece of the problem because if you're going to provide actual safety to the broadest um, understanding of the public, we need all kinds of things, including a broad range of social services, in order for our communities not just to survive but to thrive. And as soon as we narrow the conversation to policing, we, we lose sight of that. So there are multiple ways in which uh, policing itself is, is deeply flawed, even as our communities need and deserve public safety. Uh, Professor Williams, just a minute uh, as um, uh, we've got to wrap this up, but if you could just expand on that notion in terms of like, I guess the idea is that if we sat down and said the idea is we want public safety and we were starting from a blank slate, the 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 enterprise that we would create would not look like the enterprise that was created in the uh, mid 1800s. Um, uh, to basically subjugate a specific um, a group of people, um, even if that specific group of people may change over the course of time as to who fits that criteria. W give us a sense of what that would look like. Well, it would be a whole scale reimagination of public safety. And it would begin with the premise of kind of looking at who makes up the community and what would constitute making all of us more safe. For example, um, very specific. Uh, mental health interventions would be a part of public safety. We think about, it's not, not my story to tell, but an infamous case uh, from a few years back in uh, Minneapolis where a young mother threw both of her children uh, off of a bridge and um, unfortunately resulted in the death of one of their, those children. The police have been called to that home multiple times. Never were mental health professionals included in that call. So if you reimagine public safety around a range of interventions that begin with some of the basic things that we've seen introduced since the murder of Dante Wright around traffic stops, um, is it necessary to pull people over for broken taillights? Can that be administered a different kind of way? Can you have non-lethal um, uh, interventions that involve people dealing with low level um, issues in ways that again, invite people into um, and understanding a broader understanding of what keeps us all safe, as opposed to sending out the hammer, you know, to always do what a hammer does. And that's what policing is set up to do. In fact, as is, is, um, my colleague Michael Lansing argues often, um, actually policing and its failure is the greatest success story in American history because they are functioning exactly as intended. If we go back and look at the origins of policing and, and um, uh, here in 1867 in Minneapolis and uh, policing black and brown bodies is a big part of that work. They've been very successful in doing that. Um, and, you know, again, I'm not laughing about that. I think that's deeply disturbing, but we, ha we would have to disrupt that completely. And that would mean a complete reimagination of what we mean by public safety, of which policing uh, in a way that we think about arrests and um, the use of physical violence would be a very small part. It would not be the pie. Right now it's the pie. It's fascinating stuff. Uh, Yuhuru Williams, historian, founding director at Racial Justice Initiative, University of St. Thomas, uh, Professor Michael Lansing, history at Osberg University. We will put a link uh, to your public housing uh, project, uh, excuse me, public history project, over policed and unprotected uh, uh, MSA, MSP. Um, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having us on. Thanks so much. Uh, oh, sorry. 
Well, uh, we're going to take a quick break and Sorry, we're going to fill up Sorry, Sam. Uh, these <laughs> two. Uh, we'll, we're going to take a quick right break. Thing. <laughs> um, uh, thanks for your patience, folks. Uh, we are we are short staffed, and even uh, with that staff, at least one of us is uh, is is at uh, not at one hundred percent. But uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, uh, Mario Ariza, investigative reporter of Floodlight News who's going to talk to us about a referendum that is coming up in Maine um, that is something that I've been, uh, you know, advocating for, for, for a long time. And that is essentially the, well, I'm going to ask him what we call it when a state uh, essentially um, uh, uh, does its version of uh, nationalization uh, of its energy delivery uh, grid essentially. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back after this. We are back, Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. I uh, want to welcome to the program Mario Ariza, investigative reporter at Floodlight News. Uh, Mario, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me, Sam. Um, so there is a, um, a November referendum in uh, Maine that is essentially going to determine the fate of two prominent and maybe a couple more, but uh, you'll tell me electric utilities that would more or less be uh, voted out of existence in Maine, at least in their current form and uh, ultimately replaced with a, a not-for-profit. Is that right? Yep, that's correct. Um, the uh, folks in Maine are going to get the chance to vote this November on whether or not to institute uh, what is likely the largest public power takeover in the history of the United States, if it passes. Uh, they have uh, two utilities there. Note, these are only transmission utilities. They don't generate electricity. Uh, called uh, Central Main Power and Versant Power. And if the vote passes, the process will begin, where these two utilities will be purchased uh, by the state of Maine. And they would be run as sort of a, a private-public partnership from now on. Um. So uh, to be clear, this they're not generating the power. They're just in charge of basically the transmission lines and charging you for this infrastructure that they built Correct. or bought. Right. Poles and wires. And um, what, why does Maine want to do this? I mean, I could think of a lot of reasons why one would want to do it. But uh, what is like, wh how did this proposal come to be on the ballot? That's a, that's a great question. Um, the, the essence of it sort of boils down uh, to Mainers being angry with their utility. Uh, they are dissatisfied with the service record of uh, Central Maine Power uh, quite generally, right? Like, listen, Maine has a lot of trees and you, you have a storm in Maine, the trees fall down. It's the most heavily forested st forest state in, 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 in the nation. And it takes a while to get that electricity hooked back up. Uh, so it's a challenging place for a, a poles and wires only utility to operate. But at the same time, uh, Central Maine Power has had some, some you know, very public snafus. They instituted a, a new uh, uh, electronic meter system back in 2017 that, that did not exactly go over very well. Uh, Portland Press Herald did a great investigation into how that messed up. Uh, and additionally, you know, there's been some complaints about how slow uh, this utility has been to connect uh, solar to the grid. Um, so it, it's it's kind of, you know, 
a little difficult for Mainers um, at the moment. But additionally, you know, Mainers aren't necessarily happy with the fact that this is a utility that's owned by a giant multinational uh, holding company out in Spain uh, called Iberdola. And there's, there's, you know, just a tiny little element of nativism to the campaign to get rid of them. Uh, you know, don't send our money to Spain kind of thing. Uh, so yeah, those are some of the main reasons why folks in, in Maine aren't necessarily happy with these utilities. What's fascinating about it to me is this is not an ideological argument. This is purely, it seems to me, I mean, there's a little bit of nativism, as you say, but this is not an ideological argument. This is, we see a company whose job it is to essentially protect and service poles and wires. And it used to be, and I can, I can tell you this, um, when I was a kid, the electric company would come out and would go through the neighborhood and they would do this on a regular basis. I don't know if it was like once a year or whatever it was. And they would go and they would trim any trees that were near uh, the power lines. They would do a lot of um, maybe uh, preventative maintenance, I guess is what it would be called. Um, and they basically, once these, these, uh, companies started to, um, uh, consolidate and have the pressure from wall street that they've got to deliver a certain amount, they basically said, it's cheaper for us to wait until one of these trees, cause we, we could either cut down 10 trees to avoid, uh, one of them falling on the wires, or we could wait until that one does, and then just go fix the wires that's going to be cheaper for us. But the, the cost associated with that is borne by the customers who don't have electricity for all those days. Um, and, and that seems to be the dynamic that Mainers, there's other factors, but that seems to be a main uh, problem with, main, forgive the pun, uh, hmm. with, with, this, with this setup. And this is one that's replicated all around the country, it seems like. Yeah, listen, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if, if that specific dynamic is what's going on at Central Maine Power. I don't I don't have any evidence to say whether or not uh, they've changed their uh, maintenance um, uh, paradigm because of, you know, pressure from their parent company for more profits. How, however, uh, you know, I, I can say that the, the main uh, uh, public utilities regulatory body uh, has has put some very stringent requirements on the company to, to increase and improve uh, reliability measures. So it, it is something that folks over there are very concerned about and, and is not, you know, uh, they're kind of peeved about, shall we say, the papers are. Um, but, but really, I, I think you hit the nail on the head when you said this isn't an ideological fight. Um, and what I found really fascinating about writing about this particular instance is that it's really a discussion about who's going to lead or a debate about who's going to lead uh, the future of energy and renewable energy in Maine. Because Maine already has one of the cleanest energy mixes in the country, right? Uh, it's a lot of hydropower. And it's a question about what the energy transition is going to look like and who would do that energy transition better, right? Is it these big investor-owned utilities that are answerable to their shareholders? Or is it this different system that the Mainers want to try and kind of build as the plane flies off the runway of this public power utility? And to be clear, uh, as you're saying, like, you know, build this um, um, uh, airplane as it's flying off the runway, the, the, the referendum itself calls for essentially a committee to, to, to build that airplane, uh, to, right? I mean, it doesn't outline exactly what it's going to look like. Yeah, so, so the referenda would be sort of like, if it passes, it would be like the starting gun uh, of a very possibly long marathon beginning. Um, because what essentially has to happen for the state to take over this company or these companies is that the state and the companies would have to agree on a price between the two, uh, you know, how much is it worth? Because we have to buy out. We can't just take your stuff. This isn't Venezuela. Um, and at the end of the day, that negotiation and those court battles, you know, could take 10 years. So this could become very costly. It could go off very smoothly, depending. I, I don't know. It depends on how, you know, gently into the good night CMP and Versant want to go. Um, but, you know, then you'd have to figure out what 
running that utility for almost a million customers would look like. Uh, you'd have to get basically a, a private operator to run it, and then you'd have an elected council overseeing the private operator. And wouldn't, I mean, I would, if I had to bet, I would say that this private operator is going to be one or two of these two companies um, that would be then like, look, you're, you have a new business. You're just, um, you're just, here's your new business is that um, you're doing exactly what you did before. Um, but you're, um, we're just going to direct your operations in a different way. And the, I mean, I would imagine we can look at this, co these companies books and say, this is what profits are. And all of a sudden, you can have those profits. And instead of that being profits, just reinvested into providing better service for customers. Yeah, so I, I don't know who would end up running these, um, uh, you know, who, who would be the, the system operator, shall we say. I, I don't know if, if CMP or Versant has expressed any interest in that. Uh, they may not necessarily want to tip their hand. But, you know, one of the main differences here is, is the incentive structure that would exist, right? Right now, the utilities have, the privately owned utilities, they make profit by increasing the pot of money that they have, right? They make profit by putting more capital into the quote unquote rate base. The more poles and wires that there are, the more guaranteed profit they get on that total bag of money. That's because of, uh, of because it's a very highly regulated uh, business and you get essentially like cost plus 10, for example. Exactly. Or if you're in Alabama, it's almost 14%. Okay. Um, with this structure, it would be pretty different, right? You would have a very, very different incentive structure, uh, you know, if the public power thing happens for that uh, operator to make profit, right? He would make profit, I don't know, off of a series of other uh, benchmarks. Um, but essentially it would also be a lot cheaper for the state of Maine to be able to borrow money to improve its transmission networks to increase reliable energy is one of the arguments, uh, renewable energy is one of the arguments that people are making uh, when they're talking about this thing as, as if they want to vote for it. Um, because, you know, it's a lot cheaper to borrow money as a government than it is to borrow money as a private corporation. Um, so it, that's sort of the, the central argument at the moment. Um. And let's just uh, touch on the enormous amount of money that is pouring in to defend private ownership of, I mean, I don't know if you have an argument as to like why this needs, why the marketplace can handle this better than a government. I'm open to it, but they're so highly regulated. They have no competition. Um, it is, there's nothing about a market that's going on here it seems to me it's just essentially like we have one private monopoly uh, acting in the interests of shareholders, or we could have one government monopoly acting in the interests of people who could theoretically vote them out of office. I mean, that's one way to structure the argument. Sure. I, I, I Listen, what I found really fascinating about uh, writing about Maine is that usually a lot of these utility uh, political operations happen in the shadows, right? Uh, for example, here in Florida, uh, you look at uh, Ohio, utilities often use a lot of dark money that's really hard to trace and election laws uh, in these states aren't necessarily the, the best for transparency. Maine has some of the most amazing election laws I've ever seen when it comes to transparency. I mean, like as an investigative reporter, I love these things because you can literally figure out where these dudes went to lunch. It's great. And so you can see the structure of how these companies make their argument to the public. And you can critique that argument because as a reporter, you can say, well, they're saying this, but that's not necessarily that accurate, right? So that's why this was a lot of fun for me. Um, now, this is a gobsmacking amount of money for Maine, which has like 1.3 million people. We're talking over $18 million since May, right? I don't know how much that's increased. We're, we're in September now, the election's ramping up. It's probably higher, it's certainly higher. Um, and these companies, you know, on the one hand, you can say, my God, should they be putting this into the, into the rate base to improve service? And on the other hand, if you know, you're a pension fund who owns stock in these companies, you're like, wait a second, 
This is a fight for their lives. Spend, boys, spend, right? Um, so there's two arguments to that. But what I find really fascinating about following this main is that so often in the U.S., big corporations get to make arguments to the people, and they get to do so quietly. Right? They get to do so. They get to hide their hands. You don't necessarily know who's pumping the dark money into the C4 that's making the mailers, that's putting the Facebook ads, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Here in Maine, you know, you can see it. And, and I think that's great. Right. I think that transparency as a reporter um, is, is good for people making their own decisions. It helps me help them make decisions. How, do we have a sense of like what Mainers are, are thinking about this? I mean, do we have a sense of how much that is, um, the, that dynamic is helping clarify things for folks? I'll, I'll give two uh, instances. And, and this is also why I'll, I'll give two, two anecdotes. And, and this is also why Maine is so fascinating because it's not ideological. It like cuts across party lines, right? You'll have a lot of Republicans who want to vote against uh, or, or want to get rid of, of central Maine power. And you'll, you know, a part of the Democratic Party establishment in Maine is fighting to keep this thing alive. It's very fascinating. Um, but so in Maine, uh, you know, I heard accounts that when the central Maine uh, or the the people who were gathering ballot signatures to get this on the ballot uh, to get rid of the utility, they'd go to a state fair. They, they, they'd hear people yell out, you know, F, F central Maine power. Of course, I'm going to sign. Right? Like people really don't like this utility in parts of Maine. They, they just, it doesn't have a good brand identity. Um, but there's also former legislators, uh, I think she was a Republican that I spoke to, who for free of charge, right? some legislators are getting paid to advocate, but for free of charge, have gone out and advocated against getting rid of central Maine power because they genuinely don't think it's a good idea. They say, hey, we're basically signing on to like an unfunded liability here, or an un, you know, structured liability. Interesting. Well, uh, um, uh, Mario Riza, um, Floodlight News, we'll link uh, to Floodlight News. And um, uh, if you have any other pieces, we, you know, uh, Bradley, we'll, we'll post them as well. We've uh, got one coming out this Friday, which I think you folks may be interested in. Uh, I'll, send it, I'll send it to you uh, when it's out. All right, great. And we will uh, link to that as well. A really interesting story. Uh, appreciate uh, you coming on today. My pleasure, Sam. Thanks so much. All right, folks, and uh, on the I am here, uh, Art Vandelay tells me if you're in Maine and you're interested in supporting Pine Tree Power, Pine Tree Power would be essentially the public version of the existing uh, two major electrical um, electricity delivery companies, for lack of a better term, that is on the top of my head. Uh, Pine Tree Power is looking for canvassers. They are completely outspent. I mean, just enormous uh, dynamic here. Uh, there are Zoom information sessions every Tuesday night, and they're looking for canvassers. You can go to pinetreepower.org for more information. We will put that in the YouTube and podcast description as well, pinetreepower.org in Maine. Um, it's going to be a long process. <laughs> it would be a great, um, great example for the rest of the country, frankly. There is absolutely, in my mind, no argument um, as to why. Then I would be more aggressive in sort of uh, uh, taking, you know, we have a take. We know that governments can uh, take private property if there is a, um, uh, a legitimate public reason if these folks are fairly compensated. Um, for me, I'd have this all wrapped up in six months. But it's not me. Uh, but head to, uh, head to our, uh, our blog and YouTube and uh, pinetreepower.org if you want to get involved there. All right, we're going to take a uh, quick break and head into the fun half of the program. Again, fun half will be a little shortened today. It wasn't even that shortened yesterday. I don't know, 45, an hour and 15 minutes? Like, I'm trying to keep it yeah, short. Yeah, we went till two. We went after, after two, I think. We did pretty good. Because um, I am not at 100%. Um, I'm not going to lie. 
Um, even at 70%, though, I'm doing a show longer than, you know, people are at 110%. That's right. <laughs> uh, folks, it's your support that makes this show possible. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, you not only get the uh, free half free of commercials, you get the fun half as well. You can I am the show if you're a member. All of this is always available through the app. It's free to everybody, majorityapp.com. Also, check out the AM Quickie at amquickie.com. Sign up. You get three emails a week for free. Then if you want it every day, uh, we've got a, uh, a premium subscription on that email newsletter. That is a, it's really just a service for us. That has been a money-making loser for five years now? I don't know. Since pre-COVID, um, what am I doing? I'm going to take a business course or something. <laughs> but once I start something, I can't, like, turn it off, even if it doesn't make any sense. Um, also, uh, shop.majorityreportradio.com that's our merch store that is a cash cow we sell so many t-shirts and majority report hats and tchotchkes uh check it out shop.majorityreportradio.com um What's the word? Is Emma coming in? To, is Emma going to do the show tomorrow? Is yeah, I, I, I think I think we will, in some capacity, uh, definitely still need, needing to iron out entirely what we're doing. We will, I believe, we will have some uh, form of ESPN tomorrow to discuss the um, extremely eventful Week One of NFL action and give our picks for the <laughs> week the for Week Two action. So, uh, youtubecom slash ESPN show for more and for more info, and also keep an eye on our Twitter feed at ESPN show as well for more updates on that. And also, uh, uh, Matt was Matt was able to uh, join David for Left Reckoning last night. Um, they spoke Matt with joined um, was on left reckoning last night it see, it seems that he made it seems that he was able to make his make an, a return appearance um so he spoke with they spoke with Kurt Hackbarth who's a Mexico based journalist to talk about um president obrador his potential successor and um a little bit more from there so youtubecom slash left reckoning and uh, patreon patreoncom left reckoning to access the post game okay folks quick break We'll be right back. 646-257-3920. We'll turn on the phones. Um, I don't know. Probably about, uh, probably about five, ten minutes. You right. are in for it. All right, folks. 646-257-3920. See you in the fun. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. Who sent us this? Alpha males are back, 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 boy is back, and the alpha males are back, back, just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy is back, and the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, back, back. Snowflakes has what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman! And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar, what a, whoa, what a, what a fucking nightmare! What a fucking nightmare! Can you bring back DJ Dennis? Yeah, or a couple of them, just put them in rotation. DJ Dennis. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break. That's fucking nonsense. See white people doing drugs, they look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Uh, Snowflake says what? 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 A hell of a lot of bank. Okay, I'm making stupid money. Hell of a lot of bank. A 
hell of a lot of bank. <laughs> All lives matter. <laughs> Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are black, 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 black. And the Africans are back, 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 back. When you see Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on. Fuck em. Fuck em. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday. My birthday. Happy birthday to me, Jew boy. I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. Black. Alpha males are black. Black. Africans are back. Back. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Someone needs to pay the price of blasphemy around here. I, 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 I am a total pussy, 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 pussy. We are back, Sam Cedar, on the Majority Report. Fun half, ladies and gentlemen. So fun. So fun. Let's go to the IMs. Moody Monkey, another day. Thank you for sacrificing comfort to bring us great news and content. You are welcome. 502 Drew. Mark Marin had Naomi Klein on WTF recently, and you got name, drop, uh, name dropped a few times. Oh, that's very sweet. Uh, Majority Report wardrobe coordinator Sam reads a headline about boomers about boosters being recommended for everyone. Well, there's something that could have been brought to my attention yesterday. I said that yesterday. Three weeks too late. Oh, from South Dakota. Can I get a shofar for my two-year-old? <laughs> 